Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Tuesday, May 17th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, a victory for 9-11 truth as the Senate finally passes a bill that will allow the victims of September 11th to sue the government of Saudi Arabia for funding and aiding the terrorist hijackers. Meanwhile, Barack Hussein Obama is expected to veto the bill, and the Senate is expected to override the veto. Does this mean the 28 pages will be released to the public? Then, how to beat your wife like a boss. An official message from the government of Saudi Arabia. And sadly, it's not satire. And former CIA smuggler Robert Tosh Plumley reveals how the United States government has been infiltrated by an international crime syndicate. That's coming up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, 9-11 is back in the news tonight. We have the Senate passing a bill that would allow 9-11 victims to sue Saudi Arabia. And of course, last night we talked about a billionaire who said he's going to buy a building and a 747 and fly it into the building so we can put all the conspiracy theories to rest once and for all. Well, you know what? If he gets another building that isn't hit by the plane, a steel skyscraper to fall down right in its footprint, like they did on 9-11 Building 7, then we can say the conspiracy theory of the government, the official conspiracy theory, is true. But of course, part of that official conspiracy theory is the missing 28 pages that implicates the Saudis in 9-11. That would give them, that would expose them to some liability issues. And the Senate has now passed a bill that would allow victims to get compensation for that. Now, it's interesting to see the reaction of various senators, especially the reaction of House Leader Paul Ryan. He says, I think we need to look at it. I think we need to review it to make sure that we're not making mistakes with our allies, that we're not catching people in this who shouldn't be caught up in this. Oh, was that why they redacted those pages? Now, you see, Paul Ryan, like Hillary Clinton, is tied to the Saudis. And just like President Obama, he bows and scrapes to them. Now, same time, Speaker Ryan is telling us that voters are right to trust Donald Trump more than him. And I would agree with that. He says, don't get into the habit of thinking that I'm going to comment on what's up and what's down. What article is here? What article is there? I'm focused on policies and principles and unifying our party. Yeah, he wants to unify the party. That's why he put himself out there and says, well, I don't think I can support Donald Trump just yet. I think he's going to have to come around a little bit. I want you all to understand that I am king of the opposition. You know, it was four years ago when he was Mitt Romney's running mate, and it was time for us to go back and look at some of these things now. In The Atlantic and The Washington Post, many articles were coming out, mainstream media, talking about how it had surfaced that in high school, he was voted the biggest brown noser. And you can see that clip right there. He was also the prom king. Things really don't change much, do they? He's still the biggest brown noser, and he still thinks that he's king of the prom. That's why he blasts Donald Trump. Remember he said that the proposed ban on Muslims entering the country was unconstitutional? Please explain to us where in the Constitution it says that there is a right to immigrate. There's a lot of rights that they trample on on a regular basis, but there is no right of immigration in the Constitution. Let's take a look at this government that he doesn't want to criticize, our allies, or as maybe we should call them, his donors, just like Hillary Clinton does. We're going to take a look at a video here in just a moment, put on national TV in Saudi Arabia by the Saudi government on how to beat your wife. But before we look at that video, I want to read to you an account that surfaced today from The Guardian, a woman who watched the Saudis beat her husband. Why would they beat her husband? Well, he was convicted of insulting Islam through electronic channels. He had a blog that was critical of the Saudis, a blog that was critical perhaps of the Islam religion, which they don't tolerate. And so he was sentenced to 10 years in prison, a thousand lashes. And in this very touching story here, she says uh, she talked to him on the phone and she fled. She, she got out of the country, went to Canada. So they've, they've talked on the phone. She calls him up and he says, I, I need to tell you something. Will you promise me you'll be brave and not tell the children? He said, tomorrow they're going to start enforcing my sentence of a thousand lashes. He said, one of the prison warders told me, he said, it's going to take a moment to understand what he was telling me. She said, yes, 
The first 50 lashes, I'll get them in front of the big mosque in Jeddah. She says, I simply couldn't imagine the authorities going ahead with it. She said, I struggled to talk to him. I said, that's impossible. He said, no, it's going to happen. So what she does is she tells her children they're going to have to have a few media-free days because she doesn't want them to see this. Basically, they're going to beat him to within an inch of his life if they don't beat him to death. It's incredibly brutal, the process. She talks about it. She says, finally, she got the courage to watch it. All of her friends were talking about it. It was showing up on Facebook. She gets the courage to look at it. She said, as the guy who was going to do the beating came out, she said, the man himself couldn't be made out in the video, but I saw clearly that he was striking Raif with all of his might. That's her husband. She said, my husband's head was bowed. In the very quick succession, he took blows all over the back of his body. He was lashed from his shoulders to his calves, while the men around him clapped and uttered pious phrases. It was too much for me. It's indescribable watching something like that being done to the person you love. She said, the men I had seen in the video might as well have put me in the square and flogged me. But the worst of all was the feeling of helplessness. Well, you know, they would put you in the flog, in the square, and they would flog you. It's not just our speaker who is a sycophant to them, of course. It's also Hillary. Why isn't Hillary triggered by the abuse of people, especially by the abuse of women? We're going to play this, this video of how to beat your wife. You know, Hillary Clinton says she knows how to deal with men who get off of the reservation. The Saudis know how to deal with women who get off the reservation as well, don't they? Okay, if they get a little bit uppity, husbands, you need to put them back in their place. You need to show them who's boss. You may even need to beat them like a boss. That's what this video shows us, how to beat them like a boss. Okay, because if you don't discipline your wives, Saudi men, they have religious police, and they'll do that for you. They'll do it right on the street. They'll beat them right on the street. Or, as she was saying, they might as well have put me in the blocks and flogged me. Yeah, they'll do that as well. They'll do that as well. So let's, uh, let's play a little bit of this video, because it begins in a very pious manner. He comes out and he says, Allah's blessing upon you. Welcome to our show, which will deal with wife beating. <laughs> this is incredible. This is national Saudi television. He says, I'm aware that this is a thorny issue. Yeah, it is a thorny issue. Now, we're going to go to the wife beating, but, it, you know, we want to get this in context and... I wanted you to see the beginning of that because that's what this video was about. People are going to say, oh, you took this out of context. No, this is the video they put on national Saudi TV about how to beat your wife. Now, from this point, he goes to some more gradual issues because, you know, we have to bring those women along gradually sometimes. You know, when you show them that you're the boss, sometimes you've got to do it a little bit cautiously at the beginning. And so he suggests a couple of things like alienation of affection. Get them out of the bed, or you leave the bed, or maybe, he says, maybe you leave the house and you sleep somewhere else, yeah, to teach her a lesson. Or maybe you sleep on the floor or have her sleep on the floor. But it's alienation of affection, which in the West would be grounds for divorce, but over there it's just the beginning of discipline. Then from there we go to how to actually do the beating. Let's pick it up from that. Because then comes the third stage, the issue of beating. And we have to understand that the aim here is to discipline, not to vent one's anger. You know, we're not angry about this. We just need to bring these women into line. So he says, the necessary Islamic conditions have to be met. The beating should not be performed with a rod like this one. Yeah, don't hit him with a big stick, okay? Uh, nor should it be with a headband, which some husbands use to beat their wife, or with a sharp object. Yeah, don't poke them with a sharp object or strike them with your sword. That could cause the head to come off. No, let's, let's see how he proposes to do this. Uh, okay, so here's how you do it. It should be done with something like the suak, a tooth cleaning twig. Oh, it's not a flogging, it's a flossing. Okay, so here we go. Uh, <laughs> it should be beaten with a suak like this or with a handkerchief because the goal is merely to make the wife feel humiliated. Oh, no, wrong that she disobeyed her husband. Okay, look. Do you want to live in a country that is conducted like this? I guess we should just open up our borders and allow the Wahhabists to come into our borders unchecked. Because, you know, that's in the Constitution according to Paul Rhino. We just have to have open borders and immigration. That's the, the Constitution according to Rhino. Now, let's take a look at what the Pope is doing, because he's spoken out this week, spoken out about the West, criticizing the West for trying to export our values into Saudi Arabia. 
First of all, go back a couple of weeks and take a look at the fact that the Pope actually, for the first time I remember, actually talked about Jesus or Christianity. And he was abused on Twitter for this. Pope is uh, targeted with sickening abuse, says Reuters. I say uh, he tweeted out, Jesus Christ, the incarnation of God's mercy, out of love for us, died on the cross, and out of love he rose again from the dead. Ooh, that's hate speech right there. They went all after him on Twitter because this is the first time this guy that they love so much. Remember when he talks about climate and everything? The liberals love him. Oh, he just, this, why can't all the popes and Christian leaders be like this guy? When he talks about socialism, he says, we need to get rid of capitalism and shut that down, and we need to clamp down with climate controls. They love him. But when he talks about what he's there to talk about, supposedly, Jesus Christ, boy, they come after him pretty hard. So he learned the lesson. He comes back today, and he criticizes the West for trying to export its own brand of democracy to Iraq and Libya. The Reuters says Pope Francis criticized Western powers for trying to export their own brand of democracy. He says, faced with current Islamist terrorism, we should question the way a model of democracy that was too Western was exported to countries where there was a strong power, as in Iraq or Libya. Hmm. Okay, so when we talk about Islam and people call us racist, we've pointed out many times Islam is not a race. And it isn't simply a religion either. It's a government. And I think the Pope understands that. He's saying, you tried to sell them a different form of government than Islam. You tried to sell them a liberal democracy where people have individual liberties and you're not allowed to just beat people or cut their heads off, have abusive, excessive treatment. We have laws against that in our democracy, but we shouldn't impose those kinds of values on Islam. They should be able to come here freely and impose their values upon us. That's what the Pope says, okay? And, and clearly, the Pope is also allying himself as a form of government. He's taking political sides. That's what he's been predominantly a political Pope. He says, we're ghettoizing migrants, and it's not only wrong, but it's misguided. Look, you have to understand, they are self-ghettoizing because they come to this country and they don't want to be part of a melting pot. They want to maintain themselves as separate and distinct. They want to keep themselves pure from these Western influences. And then the second generation comes along and says, well, wait a minute, I don't have the same kind of stuff as the kids I'm going to school with. So they get pretty angry about it, turn into radicalized terrorists, even if their parents weren't radicalized. That's part of the radicalization. But they are the ones who are ghettoizing themselves. And he goes on to praise the mayor of London. And he says, in London, the new mayor was sworn into a cathedral, will probably be received by the queen. This shows the importance for Europe to regain its ability to integrate. So it's okay for Islam to come here and give us their values. It's okay for the mayor to be a Muslim, but we should not try to impose democracy on them. Isn't it interesting that the Telegraph quotes Sadiq Khan, and he comes out and says, Donald Trump's ignorant view of Islam could make Britain and the U.S. less safe. Now, that's a headline from The Telegraph. I think this headline from Information Liberation is much better. It gets to the essence of it. London's Muslim mayor tells ignorant Trump, quote, Muslims will start killing people if he doesn't let, us, let, let them into the U.S. Now, that's essentially what they're saying. That's not exactly what he said, but that's essentially what he's saying. He said, Donald Trump's ignorant view of Islam could make both of our countries less safe. It risks alienating mainstream Muslims around the world and plays into the hands of extremists, you know, like the ones who run the Saudi government, who advocate beating their wives, who beat men in the street because they ran a blog, who cut off heads. He says, Donald Trump and those around him think that Western liberal values are incompatible with mainstream Islam. London has proved them wrong. Well, the Pope thinks that they're incompatible. And then look at this quote from RT. Mosques around the UK have ordered Muslim women to stop wearing trousers, leaving the house without permission from their husbands or using Facebook in new controversial rules published by various Muslim organizations and associations in the UK, in the UK, bringing their values in the UK. Values that say, unless your husband tells you that you can get on Facebook, you might have to be disciplined. And of course, we know what happens to individuals once the government gets under Sharia law, those individuals will be flogged publicly. Now, what the Pope didn't have anything to say about was the Supreme Court coming out and mandating, as we mentioned yesterday, the fact that the little sisters of the poor, Catholic nuns, 
who are caring for the aged and have done so for 175 years. They are being forced by the American government to violate their conscience and to purchase insurance that would pay for abortions and birth control. He has nothing to say about that, and yet he upholds Islam. And then finally, let's take a look at what happened today with U.S. justices at the Supreme Court after they say that the little sisters of the poor have to do what Obama says and buy insurance that violates their conscience. These same Supreme Court justices violate the First Amendment, upholding a ban on protests in the Marble Plaza in front of the Supreme Court. They say that it is unlawful to parade or to stand or to move in processions or assemblages around the Supreme Court building. What does the First Amendment say? It says there shall be no law abridging people peacefully assembling and petitioning their government for redresses of grievances. Grievances that the Pope doesn't have with them, but grievances that we do. And so we have the open violation of the Constitution by the Supreme Court thumbing their nose at the First Amendment and saying, not here. You won't have any free speech here as they force unconstitutional mandates down our throats. Stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk to someone who recently traveled to Mexico. He's going to compare Mexican airport security to the TSA. And then we'll have a news blitz from Jakari Jackson and Joe Biggs. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Now, we've had a lot of stories. We covered a lot of them yesterday about what's happening with the TSA all over the country. And of course, it's kind of focused in Chicago but it's not exclusive to Chicago. It's happening all over the country at all the major airports. The common problem is the TSA. And it's not just airport travel. It's going to metastasize from there because this is the transportation security agency, not just the airplane security agency. I wanted to talk to someone who contacted us and said, hey, I just flew from Illinois a couple of months ago to Mexico. And there's interesting contrast between security in America and security in Mexico. I can tell you some things about it. So now we're going to talk to David Dalka with Fearless Revival. Welcome, David. It's a pleasure to be with you, David Knight. Tell us a little bit about, now you, you flew out of Chicago. Did you see the massive lines that everybody is talking about? I, I flew on an international flight late at night, so I didn't see any of the lines uh, three weeks ago when I took started this trip. Okay, yeah, this is something that's just started recently. Uh, I guess really they're kind of gearing up for the summer vacation. I did see something flying out of uh, Austin going to Oregon that I mentioned about how uh, it was early morning and they had only a third of the lanes opened up that they had there and most of the employees were standing around talking to each other. And at that time of the day, it was almost all business travelers and everybody was going, what are they doing? Why won't the, but of course, nobody would engage them because if you do that, you know what happens at the DMV, <laughs> you know what's going to happen at the TSA. But tell us about your experience and what you saw in Mexico. Yeah, I was, I was in Mexico for a travel conference. So I had the uh, uh, experience of flying through several different airports and going to different cities over, over the, the week I was there. Um, and during that time, I, I went to three different airports and each time that I went through the security line in those three airports in Mexico, the wait time to go through the line was five minutes or less. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I can say that 10 years ago when we flew to China, I remember as we were getting ready to go back to the United States, there were announcements in the airport at Hong Kong. They told everybody, uh, if you're going to the United States, you need to get here extra early. And they had extra process and procedure. Then he said, there were all these announcements about people who were traveling to the United States. Nobody else was going through these kind of security procedures that they were having all of us go through. And we had just adopted my daughter, and she uh, did not speak any English. So my wife went out and got a bunch of uh, toys at the toy market. They had a, a, a toy market there had a bag filled with toys, and as they were going in, the security went through it, took every one of those toys and threw them away in front of my wife, in front of my daughter, and so we didn't have anything to uh, help her with the journey. And I looked at this as we're going through these procedures and thinking, am I really doing the right thing bringing this girl out of China to America? Maybe America is worse than China. Uh, tell us what the procedures were like in Mexico. Um, you know, even though there wasn't a common language, there was a there was a friendly vibe about the people as they approached you, uh, and you went through the line very quickly. Uh, the only 
you know, challenge I had one time was, you know, one time I forgot to take my belt off and they, uh, you know, they looked at that, but then they're just like, unbuckle it. And then they looked at the other side and, you know, it was boom. It wasn't, it didn't take 15 minutes. It took 15 seconds to correct this small problem. Did they take uh, it, off, did they have you take off your belt buckle, empty your pockets, take off your shoes, uh, strip down yeah, your I mean, underwear? All the basic, <laughs> all the basic stuff about emptying your pockets. I just forgot to take the belt off the one time, but the, the rest of it was, you know, it was smooth. It was quick. It was easy. Um, and there was never any lines. It was staffed properly. It was staffed towards creating a good customer experience, which is what it should be. Well, you know, but it even goes beyond that. Did they, well, I got to ask you this. Did they give you any clowns and rainbow colored ponies to pet? <laughs> no, I, I saw that. Because that's, uh, David, that's, that's good customer service. That's what we're being told now. That's the response to the TSA and the various airports. They literally are giving people service ponies that they can pet and clowns to entertain them rather than addressing the ridiculous and ineffective procedures. Because we had a lot of security experts tell us, look, if you're going to, if you're concerned about terrorist attacks, you don't bunch people up at the entrance to the airport. You don't do all these things that you're doing in terms of creating lines. And they know, and they knew uh, five years ago in 2011, when we had state representatives here in Texas trying to stop the groping of our children by the TSA, they knew at the time, and they published it in their documents, we mentioned this last night, that there was no threat against airplanes or airports. And they said, why then are we doing this? And so, well, that's a good question. They redacted that out of a lawsuit from a, an engineer who was pointing out that their procedures didn't work. And this is a guy, John Jonathan Corbett, uh, we've had him on multiple times. He pointed out that their naked body scanners could not detect weapons if you put them in certain areas on your body. So the whole thing is theater. So it's very fitting that they would have clowns and rainbow ponies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. see any down there. Uh, you know, that was, that was, that was my, uh, that was my experience down there. It was, it was only, uh, the other thing that, that stood out to me is that there wasn't any segmentation between first class and you know, normal couch seating and, and any of the airport security I, I recognize down there, they treated everybody the same. Hmm. Well, that may, that may have been what a function concept? of the airport, uh, the airline that you were traveling on. I know there's some airlines like here, Southwest doesn't uh, have different classes of, of seating. But tell us, you went to see uh, the Mexican president at, at one of the events he was speaking. Uh, tell us what security was like there. I, I did. It was... Um... It was different. Um, the first thing you noticed was there was a bunch of guys standing around with uh, with machine guns. Um, not, uh, you know, here in the United States, you often see people with dogs and, you know, on leashes and they're texting on their cell phones while they stand there with the dog. And I found, uh, you know, what was unsettling the first time I saw it. Uh, I found I found that kind of after a period of time to be a little bit more effective in, in my view. Uh, you know, it just seemed... Uh, while well, it was an unusual sight to, to me as, as an American citizen, it, it uh, you know, to them, it's, it's, it's obviously something they use as a deterrent. And I'd say that's a pretty strong deterrent to see a bunch of guys standing in front of you with machine guns. Yeah, yeah, it does act as a deterrent. I, I know one thing that really gets the government upset is if people show up at rallies uh, exercising their First Amendment rights and exercising their Second Amendment rights to uh, carry weapons. So. There's a lot of people in America that don't think that anyone other than somebody in a uniform should be seen carrying a gun. And that's the flip side of that. And we've had reporters, uh, Richard Reeves has gone to numerous events to cover uh, the primaries, Donald Trump and other candidates. And the problem that we run into there, he lost his, his car keys because the Secret Service has everybody empty out their belongings and then just shuffles through it that they don't have any containers and they just shove it and mass down to the end of the table. And everybody at the, that gets through security is left there trying to sort through their personal belongings. And he, he lost a, an expensive uh, car key that way. So yeah, security issues like that are, it's hard to say what the best way to uh, do those things are. But certainly, I, I think the thing that I come away with, David, is that there doesn't seem to be any concern just as I pointed out what the Secret Service is doing by, by putting everybody's belongings together, just what we see the TSA doing, saying, well, you know, it's, it's not our problem, it's your problem. There doesn't seem to be any concern on the American side as to how they treat Americans. They seem to be content to treat us like dirt, even though there is no reason for many of their procedures. What do you think? And, and, and that's, that's exactly why I reached out to you with this example, is, you know, I think 
looking at a best practice and a good experience and asking all of your, you know, listeners uh, to the nightly news and other programs that you might share this conversation on, you know, remind people, hey, it's about the action you take. If you contact your congressperson and senator and send a copy of this video interview and say, hey, you know what? I deserve to be treated as well as the people flying in an airport in Mexico. Uh, and not don't, just don't send them an email. Yeah, yeah actually I agree. Ca call them afterwards and request a meeting. They're your elected representatives. Remind them that well, uh, And I that would agree. And I would even it. add, David, we might say, you know what? I deserve to be treated with the respect that the Constitution demands. Yeah. Because, you know, we have a right to not be unreasonably searched, to not be treated as if we are citizens in a Nazi-occupied country. And that's the thing that concerns me, because it's not just Mexico, as I pointed out. It was everybody that was flying anywhere in the world out of Hong Kong, except the people going to America. It was only the Americans that they singled out for this kind of abuse when we have a constitution that says the government will not do that. And so that's the thing that I'm really concerned about. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us, uh, David Dalka. Appreciate it. Uh, great to be with you. Talk to you later, David. Thank you. And of course, the key thing, folks, is that if we give up our freedom, if we give up our dignity for the promise of security, we'll lose everything, including our security. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The economic impact of the refugee crisis across the world is staggering and completely overlooked. As all signs point towards a global economic collapse, in Germany, RT reports the German government will allocate nearly 94 billion euros for incoming refugees over the next five years. This includes housing integration, German language courses, and social welfare benefits and dealing with the underlying causes of the refugee influx. In February, Der Spiegel reported the German government expects 3.6 million refugees to enter the country by 2020, including the 1.1 million that have arrived in 2015. And what does Germany get in return? 200,000 plus crimes by refugees were reported in 2015. The Gatestone Institute reports the actual number of crimes in Germany committed by migrants in 2015 may exceed 400,000. The report doesn't include crime from data from North Rhine-Westphalia, the most populous state in Germany, and also the state with the largest number of migrants. North Rhine-Westphalia's biggest city is Cologne, where on New Year's Eve, hundreds of German women were sexually assaulted by migrants. Andre Schultz, director of the Association of Criminal Police in Germany, says, for years, the policy has been to leave the German population in the dark about the actual crime situation. The citizens are being played for fools. Rather than tell the truth, the government officials are evading responsibility and passing the blame onto the citizens and the police. 10% of the migrants from the chaos in Iraq and Syria have reached Europe so far. 8 to 10 million migrants are still on the way, according to Gerd Muller, Germany's development minister. The jobless, non-assimilating refugees are doing the exact opposite of what was lauded as a positive economic boon. Jobless rates among refugees are weighing down on the welfare systems where, for example, in Greece where they are heading for yet another bailout, refugees far outweigh the unemployed Greek citizens that were already under pressure with the fight to stabilize their own economy. As the Business Insider reports, on the one hand, you have countries like the UK, Estonia, and Ireland where the jobless rate of migrants is pretty similar to that of its domestic citizens. Moreover, in the Czech Republic, Cyprus, and Latvia, the jobless rates among migrants are even below those of domestic citizens. Migrants from outside of the EU see much higher jobless rates. On the other hand, however, in places like Slovenia, Spain, France, and Sweden, the jobless rates among the migrants are over 10% above that of the domestic citizens. Regardless, the handouts just keep coming out of the taxpayer's pocket. The Belgian government awarded a convicted Al-Qaeda terrorist roughly $88,000 after the jihadist claimed his extradition to the United States violated his human rights. The ECHR ordered to pay the jihadist no less than about $100,000, according to RT. His family, which lives in Belgium, had already received 11,000 euros. The United Kingdom has given, as of today, over $1 billion in aid to the refugees. The United States has dropped nearly $3 billion on the Cloward and Piven-style crisis. The criminals are clearly running the global economy off a cliff. 
all in the name of an emerging new world order rolled out in the secretive trade treaties that are on the verge of enforcement and an engineered refugee crisis. Meanwhile, the citizens of the world are unwittingly financing their own enslavement. The time for half measures is over. John Bound for Infowars.com. Now, Tosh, if anything I said was inaccurate or, or needs to be clarified, break in. You're the expert, uh, but you are a hero. You don't like to have that said about you, but you know, you're right up there with the guys uh, in 13 hours and what they did, you know, not following orders and doing the right thing. You put yourself on the line so many times. So thank you so much for your courage and what you've done. Correct me if I'm wrong on what I said and then just put it in a nutshell what we're facing, the new developments. Well, okay, Alex, thank you very much for um, having me back on your, your program. I appreciate that. Uh, you're right. Uh, the more, um, I wouldn't call it publicity, we can get out there. But the more truth and facts and vetted information that we can get out public before the fact so that we're aware as we go into this next election of uh, what we're really up against. Uh, we're up against an international crime syndicate uh, that has basically infiltrated our government at the highest levels. The gun running operation that you mentioned earlier has been an ongoing investigation for better than uh, seven years. Uh, when the Fast and Furious uh, program broke, uh, we had some very good uh, investigative reporters. We had some very good military people. We had some very good Mexican Marinos. And we had a good task force that was gathering information. Uh, we had a good intelligence. It was not an intelligence failure in that situation. It was a political failure that let all of us guys down. Um, I worked with the task force in Mexico in 2010, uh, worked with the Marinos, um, and found out a lot about international arms shipments through the direct commercial sales program, which I've covered on your program, which you covered just a few seconds ago. And um, we didn't know the extent, or I didn't know the extent, of where this uh, information was going to go to. Uh, uh, we didn't know uh, everything that we know now about how vast this international gun running operation was, was ongoing. We didn't know that the high impact weapons were being approved by the State Department to be filtered through Mexico covertly and ended up in the Middle East and Libyan bunkers and then saw in Jordan and Turkey and um, was actually filtered by radical groups um, to very, uh, got into radical groups' hands. Uh, missing Stinger missiles, 400 of them. Uh, we found out later that uh, Ambassador Stevens was attempting to buy back those missiles at $50,000 a piece. Uh, the State Department turned him down. And two weeks later, he and the other CIA uh, people that was at the CIA annex, contractors, uh, were, in my case, uh, massacred. Uh, not, not in my case, but in my view, were massacred. They were set up. Is the U.S. involved with any uh, procuring of weapons, transfer of weapons, buying, selling, anyhow transferring weapons to Turkey out of Libya? To Turkey? The State Department is now pulling hundreds of staffers from the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad as this terror group controls more of the territory around the capital city. Not only are we getting new reports that this group may have executed as many as 1,700 Iraqi security forces in recent days, including in a massacre that, that they put online and bragged about, but today we learned that the same group may now be in possession of a deadly cache of American-made firepower, Stinger missiles. They are powerful enough to take down a commercial airliner. We took this information um, when uh, along the border down here, when Fast and Furious was going. We found out uh, about arms shipments coming across Columbus, New Mexico. Uh, it was not straw purchasers like the uh, federal government tried to tell everybody, the general public. It was a major, major international gun running that was going through ports of Columbus, New Mexico, Antelope Wells, uh, Piedras Negras, um, and by the Falcon Lakes area, and uh, Lajitas was the crossover points. New Mexico, no. Army at that point in time had uh, arrangements made that some of those weapons would be um, pilfered off and given to various drug cartels and gangs. Joaquin Guzman was one of them. 
Uh, Carl Quintero was another. Uh, and there was a shipment would go through that area. Those weapons would be filled, uh, pilfered off, a percentage of them. And then other high impact weapons ended up in the Middle East in Libyan bunkers. Uh, some years later, after some of that had happened, uh, and Gaddafi was killed, we uh, CBS photographed some of the Stinger missiles in the back of Toyota trucks uh, before ISA was really a strong fighting force. I put out at that time 11 Benghazi questions, and question number six was, will someday we, our American troops, be facing those American weapons on some foreign battlefield? And that is exactly where they are today. Our troops are over in Afghanistan and all in the Middle East, and they're facing fire from our weapons that were shipped through Mexico to the Middle East as far back as 2009 that I've recorded. And I've had reports that it was actually uh, earlier than that, as far back as 2005. We attempted everything. I say we, I'm going to use the plural because there's more people than just me involved in this. We attempted to get all this information through proper channels and was flat stopped by the U.S. State Department. And I, I can't say it any stronger than that. Flat stopped by the U.S. State Department. And welcome back. It's time for our news blitz. Uh, I'm joined by Joe Biggs here in studio. Now, Joe, let's start with something that's very important. We've heard a lot of talk about the 28 pages, Saudi Arabian connections to 9-11, and now we see this. Senate passes bill allowing 9-11 victims to sue Saudi Arabia. And this is a work by Senator John Cornyn and also Chucky Schumer doing something good for a change. Or are they doing something good for a change? Uh, talking with leadership in both parties to get an expedited vote on the House bill. So we know this is a big deal. You know, everybody wants the 28 pages to be released. They even talk about it on 60 Minutes now. Do you think that this uh, House bill by Schumer and Cornyn could be something potentially useful for the American people? I mean, I don't know. I mean, we haven't seen what's in the 28 pages yet. So, I mean, I don't even know who's to fully blame. Mm -hmm. You know, there's rumors circulating around and, you know, uh, by government officials now that have uh, supposedly read it saying that there's a Saudi connection. But, I mean, there could be other people as well. Yes. Why are they so eager to just jump to allow people to say, all right, you could go ahead and sue Saudi Arabia? Um, I want to find out who else is involved. And I believe there could be more people than just Saudi Arabia involved as well. So I think... Uh, you know, let, let's see how it folds out. we still got some, some time to figure out what's in the 28 pages, and then from there, I think we can maybe better assess the situation and maybe revamp this a little bit. Yeah, so find out officially what's in the 28 mm -hmm. pages before we jump to any conclusion. That's a very yeah. good point. Uh, what do you have there? Uh, article up right now by Steve Watson. Uh-oh, Trump to meet with Kissinger for foreign policy advice. The Washington Post reports that presumptive GOP nominee Donald Trump is to meet with Bilderberg kingpin Henry Kissinger this week in order to tap his expertise on foreign policy. Now, we do know that back in 2008, Sarah Palin mm -hmm. actually had a lengthy meeting with Henry Kissinger. What do you think about this? Well, she's been criticized, talking about she being Hillary, has been criticized for meeting with Kissinger by Bernie Sanders, I believe, in the debates. And we know that Kissinger has been tried as a war criminal, not so much here in the States, but in other parts of the world. People say he has a lot of blood on his hands. So he is a controversial figure. I mean, even bad people, you can glean something from them. I definitely wouldn't consider him to be one of my buddies, but he may even be able to tell you something what not to do. So I, I, I'm, I have mixed feelings about it. I mean, I, I don't know. I, like today, even, you know, Alex came out and said that he's going to hold Trump's feet to the fire if he starts to go away from what he was saying he was going to do. I mean, meeting with people like this, I mean, yeah, it's okay to meet with people like this, but at the end of the day, hopefully he's not a... Uh, really taking a lot of advice and getting too deep in bed. I, like I would a, agree like with Like a new that. Uh, Gingrich or whatever like that. You know, that's, there's a lot of weird meetings that are happening with the Trump administration, so to say, right now. Yeah, you can hear what the guy has to say, but yeah, I wouldn't take too much advice from a guy like uh, Henry Kissinger. Let's talk about something else. Now, this is a young man that I actually had a chance to meet. Well, I shouldn't say young man. I'm only three years older than he is. But uh, he came to Austin a few months ago, and uh, he's a, a gentleman who has a prosthetic arm. He lost his arm in a freak accident with a train. And now he has a pretty advanced cybernetic arm. He's actually made drudge now because of this. And it shows advances in technology and uh, these type of things. But the thing I want to point out to people, people who want to identify, I guess, as being disabled, he says, yes, I have an advanced cybernetic arm, but he would much prefer to have his real arm. I'm yeah. sure a similar thing for people in the military. They're very happy that there are advances in technology, but they'd much rather have a fully functioning body than 
uh, as opposed to this technology. I mean, that's part of your body. That's something that you've had, you know, and it, it, it's something that people should want to have. I mean, yeah, it's great to have that technology, but, you know, we've already seen that. There was episodes in Nip Tuck where some guy had his legs chopped off or whatever because he wanted to be trans, whatever, disabled or whatever mm -hmm. they call it. You know, I mean, it's great to have the technology, but you should definitely want to do as much as you can to keep what you yeah, have. Yeah, like, and, and I've talked to the guy. You guys can go watch the interview. He said, yeah, it's, it's great, but I'd much prefer to have my own body. So keep that in mind before you do anything drastic. Joe? Well, let's take a look at socialism right now. It's back in the news. An article up by Kit Daniels, socialism, Bernie Sanders' wife bankrupts college, forcing its closure. Oh, hmm. wow. Wow. Burlington College, which took on heavy debt during the tenure of Bernie Sanders' wife, is closing down. The closure of the liberal arts college in Vermont was blamed directly on Jane Sanders, who bankrupted the school as president from 2004 to 2011. Well, so it took her a number of years to do it. Do it. That's not I'm afraid of, that Bernie could in a number of years destroy everything that men and women have fought and died for for this country. Well, they say the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other, other people's, people's money. money. And, and as I, I believe you're with me on that man on the street, I was talking out to those guys on the street. I think we're down on uh, South Congress. Mm -hmm. And I was like, does it concern you at all that Sanders is a self-proclaimed democratic socialist? And he says, you know, socialism is just a scary word for helping people. Um, in a very vague and Well, sense. I say we get some money together, we rent a helicopter or a plane, and we drop those guys off in Venezuela and see how helping it is. <laughs> yeah, we, people don't understand, and I talk about this a lot, for all you college-age kids, and, and once again, if I was 18 years old, I'd probably be drinking the Sanders Kool-Aid too, so I'm not judging you. I'm just saying that you guys have to understand that free money isn't free. Somebody has to pay for this, and let's say you do uh, go through the ringers, and one day you're the, the big successful one percenter one day, they're going to be coming to take all this money out of your pocket too. And I know that seems a million miles away, but it could happen. Uh, now let's talk about something that's not a million miles away, the issue of drones, personal drones. And uh, we've seen the FAA, FAA, they want to regulate the drones, do various things, say whether you can use these for commercial or private practices. And now they're actually developing something called the drone zapper, affectionately referred to, which they're using at the Pentagon, Homeland Security, they're developing this to pretty much shoot drones out of the sky if they come on your property. Well, can I get a drone zapper to shoot their drones out of the sky when they come hovering over my house? That's what I want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we could get one for uh, the Predator drones, and you yeah. see one of these things coming because they're not the surgical tools that they want you to believe. Yeah, they'll show you them blowing up some insurgents or whatever, but there have been multiple times they've targeted innocent civilians. It, it's ridiculous. Come on, it's a drone, man. Half of these things people are doing for fun. It's fun to go out. It's, it's awesome in our line of work mm -hmm. to use it as a way to be able to get epic footage to make awesome videos with. I mean, and it's just an, they're just always trying to get their fingers into more stuff to get more money from you. You know, ever since that happened, like there's a fine now. I, I remember Christmas time came around and one of the hottest uh, items on people's wish list for Christmas were buying these little drones from, you know, like Hobby Town or Hobby Lobby. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about if you don't register in a certain amount of time that, you know, the parents are going to get, you know, fined all this money. It's completely and totally ridiculous. Yes. Well, you know, let's talk about something that's near and dear to all of us, and that would be the Second Amendment. Yes. Hillary Clinton vows new gun grab and secret recording. The Supreme Court is wrong on the Second Amendment. Once again, Hillary Clinton just saying some of the most vile, un-American things ever. We well, have a Second it's, Amendment. It's very common when you see Democrats, because even if you go back to uh, candidate Obama, they have those secret recordings of him saying that these bitter clingers are clinging to their guns, and then he comes out and makes a joke about it. Uh, these guys are very anti-Second Amendment. You know, they'll show you uh, a puff piece every now and then. He's out there shooting skeet or whatever. But if you guys recall, uh, back after uh, Sandy Hook, and he had the whole thing going on with Dianne Feinstein, and I'll try to have this conversation with people. I'm saying, uh, Obama is hiding by, behind Dianne Feinstein, prepared to do whatever she wants to do. And as we all know, Dianne Feinstein, we've seen the clips. If she could ban every gun in the United States of America, she would do it, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. America, turn it all in. So this is the person that he put in charge to ban the firearms after Sandy Hook. And there are things on that list, Joe, uh, AK-47, semi-automatic, AR-15, some things as simple as a pump-action firearm, uh, sh pump-action shotgun. Now, is this the person that you want leading in Dianne Feinstein? Yeah, I don't know. Draft? Here's my thing. I I've got my own little theory, so to say, with this whole thing. Sure. I feel like the Democrats are the silent partners of the gun industry. I think that, too. I think they're the silent <laughs> partners. The Republicans <laughs> really are the, 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 the monsters, the face of it. They take all the blame. But the Republicans, I mean, the Democrats are the ones that come out and they look on TV and you, know, you got Feinstein or Clinton or Obama or whatever, Eric Holder. We're going to come take your guns. What happens? People go buy Boom, guns. Boom, gun industry 
blows. I think I that guarantee too. you they've got money in the game. They've got skin in the game, and they don't mind. And the Republicans are the face. They're the bad guys at the NRA. Mm -hmm. They take the downfall. Meanwhile, murder rates in Chicago, L.A., and Dallas, Vegas, and other places skyrocket. And most of these places are in Democrat-run states that have strict gun the, control. The strictest gun control. Hard to get guns. You can't go out and get one to defend yourself, but the criminals get them because they don't abide by the laws anyways. And I guarantee you, not one of those people out there shooting are a registered NRA member. Absolutely not, because we see uh, it's like every 4th of July weekend, massive numbers of people getting shot in the city of Chicago. And they say, well, they have guns in Chicago because they take them from other places. Okay, so the other places these guns come from, do they have crime rates similar to what they have in Chicago? And the answer is no. Uh, you have these uh, gun-free zones, for lack of a better term, where the criminals do not abide by the law. Just yeah. like you said, these guys are not registered to the NRA. They're not concealed carriers. The, they're not with the gun owners of America. They're, they're criminals out here doing criminal things. I mean, regardless, guns are in existence, and we can't get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Criminals are going to get them. All we're doing is screwing over good, hardworking American people that want to protect themselves and their families. Absolutely, and that's why we have a Second Amendment, and that's why you had to continue to fight for your Second Amendment. I do think there is something to that argument that uh, maybe there is something mm -hmm. with these guys who want to ban all the guns. I'll think that sometimes as well. All right, thank you so much, Joe Biggs. Well, that's it for our show. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.